Well, thanks again for everybody for joining us. Uh, our panel is Threshold to Success. Uh, and obviously success can mean a lot of different things and a lot of, to a lot of different people. Uh, we have the privilege, obviously, of having a number of different vantage points to what success means and stages on the way to success, both from people like Moni, who you just heard from, who are out there with big ideas and big aspirations, looking to create something that not only is valuable, but also is successful from a social perspective. And you have people like Teresa and Mike who look at many, many folks who are in the struggle to create success and they learn from and they facilitate and they try to grow those businesses and those ideas past the concept stage, past the early stage, through some of the synaptic jumps that businesses need to undertake in order to be successful. And then we also have the privilege of having Eldad here who has managed through many of these challenges and has managing through a high degree of growth uh, and the changes that any business, as it goes from concept to commercial viability to growth to maturity, really needs to grapple with. And there's many, many, as I think all of us know, many off-ramps on this process to success, which makes the accomplishment, the getting to that point, that much more impressive, that much more worthy of hearing about, um, rather than me spending any more time talking about the people here, I figure that they're much more accomplished in being able to tell you about themselves and about what they're doing, and the narrative arc, if you will, of taking an idea, a big idea, a valuable idea, and guiding it through the various stages that it becomes a real transformative company, a real transformative product. And with that, I'll turn it over maybe, since we just heard from Moni, I'll pass the mic to him, and he, if he has anything to add to the remarks he just had, and then we'll pass it down the line and, and hear from our panel participants as to what it is exactly, how they see the world, and how they got to where they are, and also where they, Moni used the word presumption, I use the word aspiration, where you aspire to get to. And I think one of the unifying themes for everybody here is it's very, very rare that their aspirations are ever fully achieved. They're always thinking of something new, something to add, something more that they can do. And that's really the spirit of getting to the threshold of success. And with that, I'll pass it over to Moni. Thank you so much. I must tell you that uh, I've been a few minutes ago on this podium and I'm trying to figure out again what I can do and say things that I didn't do before. But uh, this uh, morning I've seen the ex-Israeli president Shimon Peres who was here and he said that as long that a person has more dreams than his uh, doings, he's still young. When he has more doings than his dreams, he is old. So in that sense, I believe that everyone is young here. They are still young, much more younger than I am, and I'm flattered to be with them here. But in any case, let, that, let, let you tell me a little bit about what you do, because it might be that few of you haven't been here. Uh, I am a, the CEO of a company who has, uh, during the last three years, have been building the capacity of giving everyone in the world the ability of getting to the best hospital he can afford to, in according to his medical condition, wherever it's in the world, and uh, without being treated in a biased manner. And the, all the information is being handled by us out of the box. We got a certain algorithm which enables us to compare thousands of hospitals all over the world, divide them into small pieces, recombine them together, weight each one of those pieces against the other one, and then to get the verdict, where should I go with my, not small thing, most of the people will say big things, in order to get my life back. This is what we do. It was a complicated way to do. Uh, when I started this uh, way, I, I, I tried to find people who can do it for me and said, 
cracking that is like cracking the atom. Nobody can compare an hospital in Thailand with an hospital in the USA, and this to Bangladesh, and the other third one to China. It is able. It is possible. We do it. We do it today here. So this is where we are. We find that we shall open doors to people who couldn't afford themselves knowing better about what to do about themselves, whether they're Chinese, Turks, Indians, wherever they are, it will be in their language and in according to the uh, ability of doing something about that. Thank you. Moving to a completely different category after that, I hope everyone knows uh, about Tabula, but I'll say a few words anyhow. Tabula is uh, on a mission to connect people with information that uh, they may like and may interest them. And uh, we're seeing massive changes in the digital online world. Uh, each, each one of us is moving from different platforms into these small mobile devices that uh, uh, we're all addicted to. Uh, our attention span is shrinking uh, almost exponentially. And all of these trends mean, mean that the digital world as it is today needs to transform into really being personalized, into being very bite-sized, snacky. And, and Tabula is trying to change the web by personalizing every experience and allowing people to discover that, that content that they may like. We look at it as, as, discover, as what we call discovery, as, as search in reverse. Uh, when you're looking for information, you basically open a Google box and you type it in, and you get the information that you were searching for. Uh, our vision is that that information finds you before you even, even, ever knew that you were looking for that information. So it may be on your mobile device as you're viewing a video, it may be reading an article, it may be in any way that you're consuming content, at that point in time, we'll find the next piece of information that's interesting for you and that uh, you never knew that you were supposed to look for. And, and I think the growth of Tabula, which we'll talk about later, has been driven by, by a, a big vision, but knowing to adapt it along the way multiple times, starting with video, moving on to any type of content on the web, moving into very detailed personalization, but being able to see the big picture while constantly changing the details. Hi. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Shaul from PlayBuzz, and uh, along the lines of what Eldad just mentioned about the uh, shrinking attention span of users and the challenge to actually consume information on a 4.7 inches device, uh, I really like content and I really appreciate good content and good storytelling. And so uh, I partnered with a couple of uh, smarter people and together we started PlayBuzz. That is a platform that enables the, the greatest uh, publishers, influencers, storytellers to create content in a format that is optimized for these conditions and get their users back, get their attention, get their engagement and uh, actually drive meaning, meaningful results. Uh, I think that uh, um, you yeah, also relate to what Eldad mentioned about uh, success requiring uh, adaptation and constant dialogue between the initial vision you started with and the market and you know how things actually work. I think that uh, what worked really well for us and what I'm most proud of is the fact that we launched with something very lean, we threw it out there and um, a little bit later after more than 40,000 different publishers started using our platform and creating content and driving results that was the uh, guideline for us on what we need to develop and how we need to morph uh, and evolve what we do in order to super serve, the, super serve those uh, businesses uh, and their audiences. Fantastic. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Teresa Nemeshani. I'm with Microsoft not nearly as accomplished as these gentlemen over here. Um, what, what I do is lead what we do with startups in New York, which is a fairly big market. Um, work with many, many startups. I particularly focus my time on startups that are emerging through the pack to really look like they're doing something special. And if there's some connection to our technology, of course, you know, cloud is huge. Um, 
it makes us very, very motivated, and me personally very motivated, to, to help find the kind of deals that will turn a small company into a really huge company. Um, because our own distribution channels, as well as those of our customers and partners, um, can, can do things that it, it might take a very long time for an entrepreneur to do on their own. Um, so I think that's, that sums it up. Hello, I'm Mike Putin from TechCrunch, where I'm a journalist, and uh, I think you probably know what TechCrunch is if you, you're a DLD. If you don't, you're going to have to leave the room, or have you shot outside. Um, this, I, don't, I, don't, I don't quite know why I'm on this panel, but I might as well be here. Um, I would like to, I think probably, I think what we should talk about really is not success but failure. So I think most of the time entrepreneurs are um, actually not so much on the, the brink of success, but you are more on the brink of not failing. Um, and uh, anyway, if you want to tweet my, uh, if, my mum will be really happy if you tweet my photo. So I want to pick that up later on, showing my parents. That I, that I actually have been have done something with, with my life. Thank you. <laughs> go on, go for it, Niels. Well, well, thanks everybody for giving a little bit of background on yourself. And you know, Mike's here because he's the collision of old media and new media. Uh, that's why there's five of us and one of him. So he's got us outnumbered. Um, from that perspective, I think one of the ideas I'd like to maybe bring out uh, from Mike and Shaw, when you look at you know, Mike, when you're looking at an industry, people who are trying to avoid failure, or a very journalistic way to phrase it, or trying to achieve success, a very entrepreneurial way of phrasing it, what I'd really like, Mike, maybe if you could speak briefly of, when you, you probably see as many diverse ideas as anybody here, um, going all the way across sectors, stages, and a, maybe you could speak a little bit about things that are warning signs to you that say, gosh, I've seen this type of approach and I've never seen it work, or pathways that people have taken that you feel that they may be on the right path. If there are things, pitfalls that people can avoid, or things you really need to do, you know, sort of, I guess is what I call the basic cost of entry to get into this conversation before even someone like Teresa will even talk to you. Oh, that's actually, that's actually an extremely good question. Yesterday I was, uh, I was a traitor to DLD, and I didn't come at all. And I sat in meetings with about 40 companies, uh, one after the other, after which I needed a very stiff drink. Um, but what I actually was interested in, I was thinking while I was doing that, that um, a lot of the time, entrepreneurs, the most successful, you know, if you're gonna talk about success or failure, the most successful are the ones who listen. and. When I have seen, there is a particular one or two business models out there that I have seen try and try and try again. You know, entrepreneurs try something and it doesn't work. Now, when I see someone pitch me something I know has not worked time and time again, and I tell them, look, buddy, this isn't going to work. You've got to change, you've got to pivot, you've got to re engineer this. Look, here are the three examples of companies that failed. They threw money at this stuff and it didn't work. And when that person goes, yeah, but we've got something different. I go, I know, look, I know you've got a lot of self-belief. You have to have a lot of self-belief in an entrepreneur. A lot of entrepreneurs are actually a bit psychologically screwed up, to be honest with you. They have so much self-belief that basically they just want to punch through because they're working in an innovation space. They're trying to do something absolutely brand new which is super, super tough. You've got to have tons of self-belief. But you've also got to listen. If you don't listen, you won't learn. Those who do not learn from history are condemned to repeat it, correct? And so I think that being an entrepreneur, you've got to listen, and that's the way you'll succeed if you build a team around you that allows you to, to listen and allows you to be the kind of person, to be better, you know, the better, better person than you, than you can be then that's gonna work. But if you are sort of pig-headed and don't keep going, don't keep going when there's so much evidence that what you're doing isn't gonna work, then you know that ain't gonna happen, right? No, that, that's a great, um, oh yeah, absolutely. If I, if I, let's get interactive here. Um, 
totally agree with you. And you know, probably 95% of the entrepreneurs that I talk to, you know, I see a lot. So I'll say, well, did you think about this? I've, I've seen this fail, I've seen this fail. It's very rare that they, that they choose to take that, that, that bit of, of context. Um, but they are hearing advice from many, 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 many different people. And I think listening to the right people or figuring out what's, what's fact and what's fiction, what's hype. I mean, if you believe everything that you're reading, not in TechCrunch, if it's in TechCrunch, it's ace. But, but just generally speaking, there's, there's so much hype in the market and I have often seen a real difference between what I'm sort of generally hearing and then when sort of the facts are, are in front of us based on some sort of reality or documentation. I'm going to come back on that. I think you're right. And I, it just occurred to me, sometimes people say, you know, you've got to be in the right place at the right time. Right person, right place, right time to be successful. And I think also at the same time, you've got to be, uh, listen to the right people, and listen at the right time to the right information. And entrepreneurs, it's so tough for entrepreneurs because you're absolutely right, they get so much incoming, so much advice from advisors, from their team, and um, trying to filter that is super tough. Um, You've got to be that sort of a person who's going to be able to go pick out one piece of information that's actually going to work. And I think that's, you know, can you, can you be, learn that skill or do you have to be born with it? I don't know. That's a, the eternal question. Well, I will, uh, maybe, uh, you, I was gonna with your permission, I will okay, uh, represent the entrepreneurial uh, angle for it and say that uh, I'm all for listening. At the same time, uh, you know, I think as an entrepreneur, when you come up with a concept, with a vision and an idea, Rest assured that 95, if not 100% of the people are going to tell you you're wrong. Uh, and, uh, and it's okay. You know, if these people really had the crystal ball that told them what the future would look like, they would be working on a startup writing, rather than writing on those who do it. And uh, I think you need to be respectful for people with experience and listen for advice. At the same time, if you're really convinced in the vision, uh, there's no other way to validate it other than going on that journey. And be attentive and listen and figure out that the tactics may change. The product may look different, the business model may be different, the tactics may change. Uh, they usually do, you know, statistically in all of our experiences they did. At the same time, you know, if you're really subscribed to the vision and you really feel like uh, there's a need in the market for what you're doing, uh, there are ways to accomplish it. So, you know, I think that uh, without taking away from listening to other people's advice, you also got to trust yourself that uh, maybe, just maybe, you are the right person at the right time and you need to take a crack at it. I would, I would like to say something about that. And there's nothing more joyful than being I, I, proven wrong, honestly. I, like, my, there's nothing more incredible than being proven wrong. But, Teresa, yeah. I want to tell you something. I don't believe that you can become an entrepreneur without believing in something the other would do not. It's a fact of life. Otherwise, the other guys will be the entrepreneur, and you are going to be the ones who are followers. So, being an entrepreneur is something that is built in in you. You can get all the information in the world and then decide upon yourselves and if somebody is following you, it's okay. If they don't, you try to change the world. This is the idyllic way of an entrepreneur. And of course, listening is fantastic. Whom to listen to is another question. So, the, the right way is to listen, but still, you need to take the will in your, in your hands. Otherwise, others will take it. Can I ask a follow-up? My job is becoming yeah. extraordinarily so easy. easy. It's a um, hot day right before I, lunch, and I've started a food fight. Well, I, see, I, I really, you know, I see such a difference between first-time entrepreneurs and serial entrepreneurs in, in large part, their ability to cut through the noise and, and have the conviction and know when they should have that, that conviction. Do you feel that? So you're not a first-time entrepreneur? Well, maybe, you know, I'd love to get Eldad's perspective here because he's probably managed through some of these challenges and, ha is, and to get your, you know, how did you filter out the advice that was valuable, the advice that was inconsistent to what your initially held beliefs were, and, which, and how did you embrace some of that? Because I think that is a critical in any business, whether you're at the early stage or not, how, you know, unsolicited advice is extraordinarily plentiful. And how do you, how do you manage? So, strangely enough, we get so many advice, so much advice from so many people, 
all the time. So you'd be surprised. Anything from uh, contractors and, and companies that send hundreds of emails every month of how they can help us and what we should do. Please stop, by the way. Um, but, but I think the key here is who to listen to was, was what was discussed. I think it's what to listen to. Um, the, the point is we, we made some very drastic changes. When it's revolution, no one believes in it. And you have to lead it yourself. Customers can't make the leap. Your advisors generally can't make the leap. Very few people can. If it's evolution, listen a lot. Because making small changes, incremental changes, listen to the customers, they'll tell you what they need next. Add another feature, add another capability. You want to change something in a very material, revolutionary way, no one will tell you how to do this. No one will give you the right advice. I'll give one example. We were in a market um, and we were doing nicely. We had, uh, I would say, the best algorithm in the market. We went and did tests with customers. Uh, we were very successful. Six months after a test was successful, the customer actually said, your technology is better and we'll work with you. The point is, six months later, this was an unscalable business model. It just wasn't ever going to be profitable and we, we'd never grown. And what we decided to do is we believe in our success so much that we'll guarantee success. Here are the KPIs that you're looking for. We'll guarantee them. It could be revenue. It could be performance. It could be various things. So we just decided that we'll guarantee that up front. That was a business model that was not out there. And we just went ahead and did that. It was massive risk. Everyone told us we're crazy because we're going to just uh, eat up through all the cash that we have and it's never going to be successful and eventually that drove us to grow from a few millions to hundreds of millions in revenue no one would have given us that advice so i i, I would say that uh, my conclusion is listen but in a very very contextual way as to what type of advice you listen to now that's, uh, I think, very interesting. I'd love to, Teresa, just to get a sense. You, you see so many different businesses um, and try to you know, put that in a little bit of context. How often, when you see a business and it's a reasonably early stage, are they still with their initial idea or has that idea evolved a little or a lot? And then when you look at the companies that you work with that have been successful and you compare it back to what you first saw, how much evolution in that idea has been and, and, and is it driven by outside advice or is it driven by, as Shaul and Eldad and Moni have mentioned, just reacting to a vision and adapting your vision to circumstances on the ground, which is really as much as internally generated response as opposed to it is so, an, an advice from the outside. Sure. So you know, at any time I'll meet with an entrepreneur, hopefully it's not just one shot in time, but it's you know, across uh, an, an arc uh, that's, that's changing a lot. I, I would say probably 100% have changed one way or another. I mean, you know, there, there's the adage that, that no product survives contact with the market. And, and I think that, you know, whatever advice you're getting from anyone, the facts are the facts. And, you know, if, if the market is picking it up, then, you know, think about doubling down or figuring out how you can scale it or do more of that. If it's not, you don't have a business, period, the end. So um, I think that um, entrepreneurs that sh start showing that they have the stamina to withstand this market feedback and figure out what to do with the assets they have, you know, they th extend their runway a little more, extend it a little bit more, and then hopefully, you know, they take flight, you know, in time. But I, I probably, I don't, I don't know if I could think of a startup that stuck on their, their initial premise. I would say that this uh, stage uh, in a young company's life where you're beginning to get advice is a very crucial and interesting junction. I remember when we were very early on at Playbuzz, one of the world's largest media companies approached us. They just sent an email through our website. And when I just saw their name, you know, receiving an email from me, I was so excited. And they said, you know, we love what you do. We really believe in it. We want to work with you. But, you know, we want to use it in a different context. We want you to alter your system to do this and that. And it was very hard to say no. But essentially, had we said yes, uh, you know, we would never be where we are today. You know, it's like you really got to make the filter, I guess, I want to suggest 
uh, to people about uh, taking advice is aligning it back with the vision and say, does it serve that vision? Is it just a technical thing, technical thing um, that you know, I may get a press release that I'm working with that company, or you know, I may make a few dollars, or is it really something that aligns with what I want to do long term? And if it's the former and not the latter, uh, you know, the best advice would be to let it go because you can only you only have so many bullets uh, at that stage, and you got to be very very precise and very very focused about uh, what uh, you know what you put your money on. Yeah, I agree, and I think that um, making the wrong decision at that stage, in an early stage company, can basically kill the company, totally kill it. And um, many, often I see entrepreneurs say, you know, we're going to try something, and you know, if it doesn't work, we're going to go into white labeling, we're going to white label the product or something like that. And I just say, what on earth are you talking about? Like, white labeling? Like, you're five minutes old, you know. Um, usually white labeling something is you know, the sign of death, effectively. Um, but it's funny, isn't it? I mean, entrepreneurs are often l like scientists. They're actually doing experiments and to work out if something's gonna succeed or fail or not. And it's, a, it's that sort of many, many experiments. Uh, in, uh, my father's a scientist. God knows where the brains went. It certainly didn't go to me. But um, uh, you're doing many different sort of failure experiments to see what will work, you know. I, I, I would like to tell something. Um, being an entrepreneur it doesn't mean that you're stupid. It means that you have dreams and you can change dreams and you can see how it works, what can be altered in order to get better results. So you need to have the basic belief in what you do, but you can change tactics from one time to time. And this is what a, big, a good entrepreneur needs to do. Change the techni technique, add the tactic in, a, in accordance to the circumstances. So if you are referring to that, I'm totally with you. You need to be there flexible enough, adapt yourself to the market, understand what the market demands from you, and change variation according to that. But basically, you need to feel what you believe in. You cannot change your belief every day. So this is the basic uh, principle according to what I am going to. I love Shaul's example it, it actually really sums it up right because when you're when you're early that first really big deal is exactly the moment when both what you are and what you hope are sort of exactly the same thing at least from a perception standpoint so if you signed that deal you then would become the company that is a division of the big company or you're one that serves those big companies but not not your own thing and and so if in that moment what that deal is, if that is what you will be, then you're okay, take the deal, do it, you know, and double down, because it's gonna suck up 110% of your resources to fulfill it, right? You know, or are you gonna make that really tough decision that you made and walk away? I mean, that's like, that's the, the human moment of entrepreneurship that separates the proverbial boys from the men, if you will, it's tough. Uh, I'll just say that you need to change but you need to be laser focused between these changes. So you can't be all over the place and move from one idea, but you can be stubborn and stick to an idea and get all the feedback that it's not working and have that belief or have that conviction and just move, continue and continue uh, to a dead end. But when you are pursuing a path, you need to be laser focused and just execute as, as aggressively as possible towards that while being open to realizing that this was the wrong turn, and then you need to make a different turn, and again, be laser focused and in execution on driving that path. If I may ask, uh, I may make your uh, job even more obsolete, and you know, take on the moderation and ask Eldad, you know, really curious, what does it really, you know, realistically, how can you foster this kind of innovation and flexibility in a company that's worth, you know, north of a billion dollars and has hundreds of employees, and he's a market leader and, you know, uh, being at that size, at that scale. How can you really take such a, a spontaneous turns and experimentation uh, when, you know, you're riding such a big ship? It, it's a very small team that does that at the end of the day. I, I think that we need to separate execution of a very large machine, which means you need scalable processes, you need a scalable sales team, scalable account management support, scalable development, all of these need to be 
a very focused, very uh, scalable. They, they need to, to have a process. At the same time, there still needs to be a very small team of people who are entrepreneurs within the company who are looking for the next thing or the next turn in the road. And they're still a small, a small team. They can't be part of that large operational aspect. Usually, they're not good at operational things. They don't like to do the operational scale. But it has to be that small team. So in, in our company, we have very few people who are that. And that's what they do. And they look for the next thing. And they evangelize that thing with the market. And they find those next turns in the road. Um, and once it's mature enough, they hand it over and it scales. And I, and I think, Eldad, you bring out a, a really, I think, critical point in this arc of growth. And, and you think about it, is, is at what point in time do the skill set of the visionaries, the people who are willing to not listen to 95% of the people telling them what to do, the willingness to turn down an opportunity like Shaul, at what point in time do their skills become an impediment? Or do their, do their skills have an inherent blind spot and in the ability to scale, to grow, to professionalize? You now have lots of customers. You have an opportunity to commercialize, to take that step. I mean, it'd be very interesting to hear from from you, Eldad, you know, some of the human capital challenges internal to your company, because many of the people who are there at the beginning, who are the most passionate believers, are people that are harder to rein in, harder to systematize when you go from small and concept to scale. Yes, so, so I would say all, all and what you said is accurate. I would add that they become an impediment probably the first day they start the company, because that's when they make the first uh, wrong decision. Uh, but, but it's not about removing them. It's about how to continue and have in the company those people, because those are the entrepreneurs. And those are not generally not the people. Very few people um, are the innovators, the ones that will go against, uh, go against the current and, and swim against the current and make that decision that will turn to be that successful one and then be the, the person who executes at large scale. Few people do that, most don't. The question is, how do you keep them? How do you keep them engaged? How do you constantly have that noise within the system that keeps on, uh, uh, on the one hand, directing you into new direction, on the other hand, distracting you? Um, eventually, you put executives that are more execution-oriented in the sales side of the house, even in the R&D side of the house because it needs to scale, while you keep those entrepreneurs in key positions to influence where we're going. And maybe, Shaul, you could build on that, just in terms not only the human capital, but the culture. Um, you know, there, there's a very different, in my experience, there is a very different type of personality and culture that gets created as the business moves on because the people that LDAT are talking about who are more process-oriented, more systematic, they generally turn out to be very quickly the larger number of your employees. And so the leadership may be more entrepreneurial, where the, ma the execution folk, which tend to, tend to be a higher number of people. You know, I'd love to see how, in your experience, how you've dealt with that challenge. So uh, you know, I'll have to disappoint you and say I don't have a recipe for that. I'm uh, battling with those exact challenges these days. We grew, Playbus grew from 15 people to 87 uh, in the past 12 months. So we've been you know, extensively hiring, opening offices around the world, recruiting new teams, changing roles, responsibilities, defining new processes. Uh, and it's very hard to strive for perfection. It's not about perfecting a machine that does execute everything uh, flawlessly. Uh, it's really about identifying who are, the lead, you know, who are the leaders of each domain, who are the people that take ownership, that take initiative, that drive things, and giving them a sense of direction and you know, pretty much let them uh, uh, drive it. I think it changes a lot when it gets to uh, the multi-hundred number of employees like uh, Eldad is facing, and you know, definitely when it gets to Microsoft size or, or whatever. Uh, but um, you know, it's, uh, it's more of an art than science. It's about communication, and uh, I think the role of the person that uh, started the company or that runs the company is a lot about making sure that everybody's crystal clear on the vision, on what we're trying to do, uh, but giving them the freedom to interpret, a, you know, what does that mean? And what are the uh, decision in terms of execution and priorities that need to be taken in order to serve this uh, Uber uh, vision? Oh, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, one word, like, from the, from the press media angle is that um, 
I think this building has been a, started to see some uh, high profile failures in the market. Um, there's a company just um, sort of literally shut down just overnight in the US, uh, names can't escape for a second, but you know, high profile entrepreneur, lots of media buzz, w appearing on stage at all the conferences next day, bang. You know, um, a company called Shopper uh, last week, last, the last two weeks in London, raised $11 million, all of a sudden basically dead overnight. Because either somebody's just like not taking care of business, basically, you know. And I think there's, there, are, there are entrepreneurs out there who, you know, will become high profile and basically become in love with being in the media. And, um, and we don't mind that because the media is the media, right? You know, the journalists like to write about high profile, hot spaces and hot entrepreneurs and all those kinds of things. But, you know, we're not in charge of your business. You are, right? So if you don't stick to your knitting, you know, things might go south. And maybe I would, uh, I guess the discussion has consumed most of the time that we have here. I know I had mentioned at the outset uh, that you know, I would turn it over to the audience to see if they have any questions um, for the panelists, which I will, I will do so now um, to see if you can shoehorn your questions in so we don't take up the next panel's time. Um, and so with that, if anybody would like to uh, ask any one of our panelists questions and react to anything they said, that I'm sure they'd all welcome the opportunity to speak to you directly. Right, let's do survey que or survey questions, shall we? Like, no, no. Let's let, we need to go ask them something like, how many people here have etc. What's a good question? How many people? How many people here are going to basically become a billion-dollar unicorn in the next two years? Put your hand up. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, six. Right. Yeah, the Israeli economy just tripled, which is good <laughs> Goodness news. Goodness me. Please see me later. Um, how many people here have been part of something that you know they thought would be amazing, and in the end, just it just didn't happen? But yeah, go on, come on, own up. Good for you. Good for you. It's all part of the journey, right? Indeed, indeed. I don't know if any of the panelists uh, have any sort of final closing remarks. Other than that, I will uh, thank everybody. <clears throat> I was thrilled to be here with such successful people here. Uh, this panel is, is the road to uh, Unicorn. So I've been here with the people that I have to touch. Maybe will become, it will be contingent and we shall become also a Unicorn. Uh, I'm sure that uh, we shall meet again. Everyone with his dreams and the way that he tries to do business. And it's so fantastic to see people and to see how they achieve whatever they've, they've done. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, uh, I'll add that it's, it's all about the people. It's the first person you hire when you're an entrepreneur. It's the 300th people that we're hiring now. And the focus on what people you want in the organization is what is going to matter. What's the mix, where are the people? That's why at, at Tabula today, to this day, um, we, we look at who the people that enter the company in a very robust way. Um, I personally interview every single person coming in. We're 300 plus people now and continuing to do that. And, and that's what it's all about. Uh, before I, I will forget, we have our small reception with beers and everything because it's our migration. All of you are invited there at the uh, boulevard, at the start of boulevard at the end. Thank you very much. And I'd be remiss to not invite you all to the Microsoft Gallery as well. It's very cool, free drinks, free food. Yeah, come see us there. <laughs>